Try to be. Uh, I will focus on that. You know that my life cancer, we have several now uh, news. That's a main discussion that I've come here before. So, EGFR, uh, uh, I will focus on that. You know that in lung cancer, we have several now news and my main discussion that come here. So, so medical education, uh, medical now we have all these free times of the last two for retributions I showed it before. How of that medical education and medical education? We have drugs, but when we have a conversation, conversation with the company, it's like, like the question is have a diamond, but how of that is, are you taking your clinical practice? We have drugs, but it's when we have a conversation with the company, it's like, like we have a diamond, but nobody is able to take it because we know I'm not conscious about testing this drugs. Because this biomarkers to use this. So it's important that we start to be more and more conscious about the very use of efficacy of these drugs in order to be able to use this as a new generation I saw here that this is a very use. So try to use this as a new generation sequencing and also the history of other biomarkers. But with that, it will be. Is that also in the liquid right 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 so we have a very good composite and all the so uh, with that uh, I remind you that also in the liquid bites we have a very good concordance That is only just for true because we have people that are in the and they have a cross-war. 
time, but may yes, they, they are, it's true that they are mutual exclusive. Uh, that is not just for uh, 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 to uh, consider. Uh, but we have some patients that they they have they are, it's true that they are mutual exclusive in EGFR majority of them. But we have some patients that can have both values at the same time. And there is always a challenge and that happened very rarely. But it's true that EGFR, sorry, Rose and I have shared some and there is always a challenge in the patient's population. But EGFR, sorry, Rose and I have shared some actually coincidence or some characteristics in the patient's population. But Rose seems to be lower from the CV science of the canal, seems to have. How we test uh, ROS1, we have uh, obviously different partners, uh, like I said before, and these partners are also able to be done by FISH, but was recently, in May of this year, approved by Ventana, a new method for uh, immunostochemistry with a very high concordance, so we can go for a cheaper method than easy because FISH is very difficult sometimes for pathologists that are not training in reading the, the FISH, and you can have some uh, some false positives. So uh, I think with the immunosochemistry at least we will have more possibility to test uh, this kind of patients. How many patients we test in ROS? I don't know uh, here, but uh, you will be surprised that it's very, very low generally. Uh, the drug, the first drug that was used for ROS was Crisotinib and is the standard of care and Crisotinib gives an uh, overall survival impact of 5, uh, 51 months. Uh, you see that there are different variants and there are all the patients that respond more or less in the same way for the fusions of these variants. And if we are looking at it through the different trials, the overall response rate is variable between 54 to 80 percent, so it's giving an important activity impacting in the progression of survival and impacting obviously in the overall survival. There are new drugs that are coming, like lorlatinib. Lorlatinib is an inhibitor of ROS, a very potent one, and you see there that the, in, the pre, in the pretreated patients or patients that are progressing after crisotinib, response rates are only up to 36%, but the important thing is that the intracranial activity is also very high. We, we remember that crisotinib is an alkyl inhibitor and a met inhibitor as well, and the activity in the brain is very low, unfortunately, due to the lower concentrations that are arriving in the hematoencephalic barrier, crossing the hematoencephalic barrier, and also because some proteins that are in the brain are trying to push in out, uh, pulling out all this, uh, the drugs. So it's important that we have nowadays drugs that are working intracranial. When we are going to other drug, repotrectinib, I spoke about this drug before when uh, I talk about Entrac. So repotrectinib is an Entrac and an ROS also. It's also ALK, but very low activity in ALK. We will not consider an ALK inhibitor. But in, in, this is in uh, pretreated patients. 80% of response rate, also in intracranial, seems to be less potent. <coughs> but when we are going to the naive patient, you see 80% in the oral response rate and in the intracranial response rate is 100% in the, it was a very small number of patients but at least it's very active in the brain. I talk about entrectinib and I'll show you some uh, before some uh, data of ROS in other tumor types but specifically in lung cancer the objective response in brain metastasis is, you see here, this is a, the CNS at the baseline, was 73%, almost 74, and 80% in patients who doesn't have any uh, brain metastasis at the baseline. So it, the work for flow is very important. You see the activity that are uh, in green are the metastasis in the brain, in blue is no metastasis. But if we are going to see complete response in 20% for the, the 55 patients, and uh, the uh, association with the um, prolonged prolongation of the um, of the um, progression free survival of this CNA uh, metastasis in the patients with and without metastasis is there. So this is a very potent part in the brain. This is one of the cases that I treated with uh, uh, Roswell and entrectinib, and you see in five weeks of the treatment, an intrathoracic disease was reducing considerably in, uh, with the PET, but also the three metastases that you have 
you see one here, another here, for complete response after five weeks of treatment. So, entrectinib have an important activity and very quick activity in, uh, in brain as well. And if we are putting all together the post inhibitor, the activity in progression to survival is almost there, similar to uh, in the in progression to survival. Overall survival, we don't have a field uh, data here, but they are not rich at the moment that we have. And the intracranial response rate you see here is very high in some of the new drugs. And also some of them then demonstrate activity in pretreated patients. We just published the data in Lancet Oncology of the Entrectinib this week, so if you are interested to know a little bit more about the trial, you can check in, in, in the box. So if we are going for the safety of ROS1, uh, obviously there are some side effects. The only one that we know very well in Prisotinib is the visual problems that are not to fit in the other, but in the other, um, in the other drugs. But some increase of the transaminase, or for example, with the platinum, we need to be very careful also with the glycemias or um, hyperlipidemias in some of them. So, new drugs, new toxicities that we will uh, see, but generally, I was using uh, entrectinib or platinum, and we have the trial now for, uh, for repotractinib and seems to be very well tolerated. Uh, there is a new drug that is uh, from the Aiki Sankyo, but it's, uh, this is specific is called DS 651B and seems also to be very active in pretreated patients, so this is the new frontier for mutated ROS1. Uh, the ROS1 resistance obviously is the honeymoon killer uh, when uh, we have this, uh, this um, new mechanism of resistance and that's our mutations you see here. Chrysoprene, uh, we have identified several of them. Uh, one of the most common mutations uh, for chrysotinib is the 2023, but it's a common mutation that is also resistant in legatinib, seritinib, lorlatinib, and infectinib. So uh, there are some of the new drugs that we have already identified new mutations that are unfortunately uh, resistant to with low sensitivity. Important thing is when we are, I always speak about the commutation because it's very important that we see the report, complete the report when we are doing next generation sequencing. Because when you have a commutation here in, in, or in ROS, it's the same situation that has happened with EGFR. So, commutations present, worse prognosis. You see here, um, in any mutation present, 11% of the major survivor here. Uh, 42 if you don't, 40, uh, 34 if you don't have any commutation. So the presence of other mutations is a prognostic factor that we need to consider. There are secondary mutations that I showed you before, and some of these are resistant and the others are conferring sensitive to the new agents. And this is the case of the 2003 that I told you that is resistant for several of the compounds, except for repotrectinib. Since that repotrectinib that I showed you before is very active against this uh, resistant mutation, and you have here after seven weeks of treatment, and also with important activity intracranial for this specific mutation that you see here in this patient. What is important that we remember that patients that are receiving, uh, that are uh, have harboring one of these alterations, like red, rose, or whatever we see. In blue is the progression disease when we are using immunocheck points in here. So we are very careful because, for example, in the case of the ROS1, the partial response or the complete response or the stabilization even was very low, 6%, compared with the rest of the progression. So target therapies need to be, uh, target therapies are for patients who have targets. So we need to test the patient and don't go immediately for immunotherapy without having all the information. It's not ethical actually to treat a patient with immunotherapy without knowing this uh, information. So how, in just to complete the ROS1, how I treat the patient when I detect a ROS1. So I have FDA approved in, uh, in our um, uh, media in the United States. We have a treatment that was recently approved and the overall response rates are very high, 72%. The retinic, sorry, over response is 7% compared with chrysotomy 72, but also the activity in the brain is 
Yeah, very good. Seritinib, I didn't spoke about seritinib, but it's an ARC inhibitor, you know. Problem of seritinib is the toxicity, gastrointestinal toxicity, or fisotinib. In case that they progress, obviously we are doing a molecular testing to see what happened there. We prefer to do liquid biopsy. And in that case, if you have an mutation that is known like this one, you can use or the new trial, if you have it, the antisanctyl or carosanctyl is also an active opportunity for these mutations. Uh, in case that you don't have a uh, mechanism of resistance uh, identified or other mutations, glorlatinib or reprotractinib are very active. You see here the response rates. Uh, or in case that you don't have a me mechanism of mutation and you don't have access to the new drug, remember that we have chemotherapy that is still uh, uh, an option for this patient and in, with without chemotherapy, with immunotherapy, and or the second opportunity will be after chemotherapy and immunotherapy in this patient. There is a group for patients that is called the Ross Wonders that if you want to enter, and it's very good information for patients and uh, they are having it's a very you know it's a very small percentage of patients who have that and it's they are very good in, in, in helping patients to access to clinical trials and so on. Meta aberrations in lung cancer, we know that MET is a, it's a very tricky pathway. The uh, MET, uh, the, uh, the novel amplification was detected in uh, 2006, 2007. Uh, you have here the first response was in 2011 for MET, and then the first report of the MET condition in patients with MET exome 14 skip mutation happened in 2015. So, it's a very short time that we have a lot of news for MET. Several uh, years ago, in 2016, that is several, several years for oncology, we published this, uh, that is called Try to Cut the Head of the Hydra. So this is in the, who is like in the mythology, mythology of Greek mythology, the Hydra was an animal who had a snake, has different uh, heads. So when we are cutting one, the others are appearing. Um, that is happened here because we know that the MET overexpression is not the real target. The MET amplification could be a target, but there are also some mutations uh, like exome 14 skipping that are the target. So if we are looking the pathway and we are treating that, we have different opportunities. If we are going for the ligand, the ligand is the hepatocytic growth factor. Uh, receptor, this is the ligand. There are some in monoclonal antibodies, unfortunately, were negative. If we are going to the uh, semaphorine domain, uh, and we have here the extracellular portion of the receptor, we can have some monoclonal antibodies. I'll show you the activity of these monoclonal antibodies. And the real target is the kinase domain in the intracellular domain. And that you have here different target drugs like uh, chrysotinib, carosantinib, and more selective ones that I will tell you. So we can classify the, the, the new targets of the new drugs as a type 1 or type 2 according to the affinity of the RTP. But there are some of the drugs that I will present it here, like carnatinib or tepotinib, that are very active. So, what we have as a target for uh, MET. Uh, the first one is as a secondary driver, so when you have, for example, a patient with EGFR mutation and is progressing to EGFR mutation, you can have as a mechanism of resistance the MET amplification, or you can have a MET as a primary driver, the amplification per se, or the uh, exon 14 STV mutation that is the most common situation. For the first scenario, for the uh, uh, resistance to EGFR, this trial was presented in 2017 in the combination of osinatinib and anti-EGFR third generation with sorbolitinib. That sorbolitinib is a new drug for MET. And the response rates were very good, but unfortunately, toxicity was high in some of the patients, so the trial was postponed a little bit. You have here the major of activity seems to be also in patients with p 29 positive or negative. But um, you see this drug is very active. This is a patient after six weeks that she receives several of the treatments, uh, the fitting and so on. This year, in 2019, uh, the, um, the prior first generation and second generation of this combination, you see, was uh, in the P17IM negative, 
was a very important activity, but also in the, uh, in the general population and the preliminary epidemiological activity, you see the overall response rate was 25%. This is one of my patients that we was treated with a combination. She had an EGFR to 17 IM when we start oximapinib, and she progressed. You can see here at the, at the same time she had a meta amplification, and she progressed. She had a meta amplification that was, sorry to see, is very high. And when we start, so it's, it's losing one of the part. Uh, she had a good response when we did the combination of oximapinib and results. This is an anecdotal case because it's very tricky to treat the patient like that. But this is speaking about these uh, two drivers. Um, the patient is in a, in a partial response. And it's not complete here, but it's doing very well with the, with the treatment. So there are some ongoing trials that are coming, like the Savannah trial, that is a phase two, uh, that will combine the oxymetrin and sabalitin with the adjust of the doses. And the ORCAT, that is a phase two trial for patients who are progressing also to oxymetrin, and they will be matching or not with the different biomarkers. When we are using MET as a primary biomarker in the amplification of the overexpression, I told you that the overexpression is not the target really. We call the follow-up Icarus because it continued with the mythology. Icarus was the, <laughs> the uh, flying very high in the sun, near to the sun, and, the, and he fall. And that is what happened here. The, the, the trial was so ambitious and uh, in the phase three trial that was negative, they include more than 500 patients and actually was worse than the placebo, was detrimental for the patient. So there is not support at this moment with this monoclonal antibody that was on, on, on a tusumab that we can give any opportunity for this patient. But it's true that the amplification is one of the targets you see the translation with fish or the next generation sequencing uh, for the in, in, or include the patients who would prefer fish. And uh, in the data presented by Ross Kamich in 2015, I think was the, the this is a date 2018, 2014 and 2018. So you see here that the patients have a high amplification and we uh, measure that by the ratio, the ratio, and these patients have an uh, important activity when we are using chrysotomy. We have nowadays for amplification calmatinib, that is a Novartis compound. As you see, that there is, when you are having the different um, percentage, when you have a low, the activity is low, but when you have a large, a very high amplification ratio, the activity is very, is very high. And finally, methexone 14, a sticky mutation that is happening in 3 to 4 percent of the lung cancers. Specifically in non squamous, specifically and very, very important in the sarcomatoid subgroup of the non small cell lung cancer. Uh, the methexone 14 SCP mutation is the, actually is the new alternative splicing that is occurring with the exclusion of the methexone, and you have a new part of the, of the gene that we can target specifically with new drugs. This is the activity of chrysotinib. Chrysotinib is not very selective for, um, for metexone 14, and the activity is not so high. So you see here that the 9%, that is the first treatment that we have, and it's the only one that we have uh, in our media. So there are other drugs that are coming there. I will show you some of the drugs. This is a case of chrysotinib. You see a very important activity in sarcomatoid lung cancer. But we have two drugs that are coming. One is the, the, the potinib. This is the vision trial that was presented this year at ASCO. And uh, in this case, also, they include patients through plasma or tissue. And that is important because we have the concordance between plasma and tissue. And we <coughs> see here patients in first line, second line, and third line. And the activity of the drug is uh, in liquid and in tissue. I will go specifically for the Independent Review Committee, 58 and 44, 53 and 50, 30, uh, 37 and 40. So it's a very active drug, even in third line treatment for this patient. So don't forget to test your patient for that, because we have also an efficacy in the progression of survival, and you can see here in tissue and liquid. And the other drug that I want to introduce is the um, can that I spoke before in amplification, but in this specific setting, 
the demonstrate a clear activity in the shrinking of the, of the tumor with a partial response, including an overall response rate of 40%, also intracranial in patients with brain metastasis. Here, there are also, unfortunately, new mutations that are resistance, and you see here, for fisotinib, but also for stabilitinib, and the combination, there are some mutations that are coming, and specifically for metaxone for TNSTP mutation, all the drugs can have some of the mutations that you can see here. So, MET is still a tricky pathway, but we have a lot of news. For R2, and that is the last pathway that I would like to, to present, is the um, um, exon 20 mutation, so we are not speaking about the R2 amplification that is happening in breast cancer. These uh, mutations are um, happening specifically in, uh, in two scenarios we have here in EGFR, you can have uh, mutations in the exon 20, and why we put together EGFR and R2? Because these kind of mutations in both pathways are very similar in behavior, and the activity of some drug like porcelotinib is uh, that's the clinical act activity in vitro. But in, when we go for the clinical activity, 55% in EGFR over uh, exon 20 mutation, and 50% uh, in insertion 20. It's very toxic, so I, I saw last week a patient that unfortunately was going out from this trial and we don't have a lot of options for this patient. So one of the options, this is, the activity is very active, but it's very toxic, specifically toxicity is cutaneous toxicity. Uh, you see this patient after several lines, good response after three cycles with posiotomy. But we have other options that are less, uh, less active that we can use, like the comitini, 12%, Neratinib and Terastesirolimus, 21%, uh, but also Afatinib is an uh, um, R2 inhibitor, if we remember from the pharmacology. So we are using some, in uh, some patients, in this case, uh, that patient after TDM1 that they, he was receiving, we give uh, Afatinib. Uh, this is TDM1 for R2 amplified or mutated cancer. You see here in the mutant cancer, overall response rate, 44%. That is the amplified 50%. And there is some new drugs that are coming. This is Daiki Sankyo, is a uh, drug that is called uh, DS28001, uh, that is an, uh, a trastuzumab that is to come, is a monoclonal antibody that conjugate. And the response rate was 58.8%. In the mutated, specifically, uh, that's in the expressive, and in the mutated, 88%, so it's very high activity. This drug, progression free survival, 41%. This drug was recently published uh, in breast cancer, the result in breast cancer. We are waiting for the result in lung cancer. There is this trial, the phase two uh, ongoing, and this is the activity in the insertion 20. This is the patient who received several lines as well and have this, uh, um, and this mutation. This is another case of an adenocarcinoma with R2 mutated, so impressive disease with a very good response after uh, the treatment. So, in conclusion, there are promising new drugs for all targets, and uh, you see, I didn't spoke about MG, MRG1, that is also a new target that is very, very unfrequent, but if you test and if you have that, there are some RBD3 inhibitors that you can apply. And, uh, I didn't spoke about other drugs, but you have here, for example, the TAP788 that is also for, uh, R, for EGFR as well. And there are other drugs like the Satinib. Uh, <coughs> we are focusing here in the DRAC, not the <coughs> scanner, because we have several patients that have this mutation. There are some drugs, but unfortunately, we didn't demonstrate any activity. So the important is test your patients. I continue to say the same. I will say you are a little bit tired in saying the same, but it's the most important thing. If you are not testing the patient, all the big data and the marvelous activity of these drugs, you will never see. So don't go immediately for immunotherapy. Test your patients at least to know which one will not respond to immunotherapy. Thank you very much. For this.